Welcome to the Westside Investors Network, WIN, your community of investing knowledge for growth. This is the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast for real estate professionals by real estate professionals. This show is focused on the next step in your career, investing. Thank you for listening. And please, if you like our content, rate us on your podcast provider. Just a quick disclaimer, the views and opinions expressed in this podcast are for educational purposes only and should not be construed as an offer to buy or sell any shares or securities, make or consider any investments or take any other action. Welcome back to another episode of the Deal Deep Dive segment on the West Side Investors Network podcast. I'm your host, Trent Werner. In this segment, our featured guests will share their unique stories on a specific deal they've invested in. We will dive deep into finding the deal, financing the deal, writing an offer, and the due diligence. Do us a solid and smash that subscribe button, leave us a rating, and share this episode. And now, let's dive deep. Welcome back to the West Side Investors Network podcast. I'm your host, Trent Werner. On today's Deal Deep Dive episode, we are joined by Dennis Shapiro with SIH Capital Group. Dennis and I are going to chat about traditional investment assets, as well as alternative assets and how those blend together well in a portfolio so you can maximize the pros and the benefits out of each asset type. Dennis is also going to share some insight on how his group asset manages affordable housing properties as well as hospitality. Now let's welcome Dennis Shapiro. All right, Dennis Shapiro joining the Westside Investors Network podcast today. Dennis Shapiro of SIH Capital Group. We're going to talk about traditional and alternative investments today. I really want to have a great conversation with Dennis. He has experience in multiple different facets of the real estate and investment world. Dennis, thanks for joining us. Trent, thanks so much for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. So I think everyone likes to hear how, you know, our guests got started with their career. So, you know, you don't have to tell us every little detail, but I'd love to hear how you got started in real estate and investing. Sure. So I started when I was 14 years old. My oldest my oldest brother gave me a copy of Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Kind of hated the book at the time. I was a little bit of a cynic. And uh, but I was like, you know what? I have some money from my you know high school job. I was like, let me buy what's called an asset, right? So this was, uh, I want to say 2004, 2005. So I actually had to pay for a trade. And I went and I bought my first mutual fund. Kind of went through the whole process and was like, wow, this isn't really that great. Let me actually deep dive this. And then kind of went and um, got onto the whole Warren Buffett, Peter Lynch, that whole era. And I went to business school in New York City. That's all I kind of dreamt of. That's what I was going to do. And then it was like smack right into the global financial crisis. And all of that kind of went out the wayside. Uh, So I continued my education, went for my MBA in the same school. While I was getting my MBA, I got recruited to work for the government. When I got my first real paycheck, I came home. I was like, wow, it's great. Not only are they my uh, employers, but they're my business partners with the amount of taxes they're taking out. So I started researching, well, how do I pay less taxes? And it was all real estate and related. So that kind of got me into the rabbit hole of real estate investing. And at the same time, I still invested in stocks. I still had a portfolio for 10 years. I I went through 15, 20 different strategies. I realized that traditional investing is really great for equity appreciation as long as you're not going in and out. And as long as you don't you get emotional during the wild swings, it just it tends to trend upward over a long period of time. What I realized that sucked at was cash flow. Like I, I every strategy I tried to do, whether or not it was option trading or high dividend stocks or utilities stocks or MLPs or REITs, every single one of them usually underperformed the market. And whenever the market was supposed to go down, those those defensive stocks were supposed to do better. But the way the algorithms work these days, they take everything down. So I realized that my life would be a lot simpler by just doing like a classic index fund and then focusing my attention on the real estate side, which is really good at at cash flow. So when people kind of, I think we were just talking about this right before the call, is they have a tendency to pigeonhole themselves. If they work exclusively with a financial advisor, you're going to hear a lot of advice against private equity because that takes away from assets under management for them. So they, those financial advisors will steer them towards traditional investing. And then vice versa, if someone's already kind of 
dabbling in what we do with real estate investments and stuff like that, they kind of they kind of overlook the traditional side. And the truth is when you blend them together, like you take the pros of traditional investments is that you get an appreciation and you really could autopilot it where, you know, you put an index fund, how many times do you need to check up on it? You can basically hold it for the rest of your life, basically, and not put in an ounce of thought process versus the alternative side, really good with cash flow. Really, I, I think fundamentally it really revolves around creating like key relationships. Um, and then it involves time and building that. So I think they complement each other really, really well. So those are my like, since I started from 2000 and uh, since I started as a 14 year old, I had a decade of just purely traditional. Then I kind of veered into the alternatives for that cash flow and a little bit more stability. And then I kind of realized that the two go really, really well. And then, uh, and then we ended up creating our company that kind of focused on the private equity side. Yeah. And I, and I really liked what you said about you know, there are pros and benefits in both of them. I think real estate is a little bit more tax advantageous than, you know, stock investments. And, and there is good appreciation in the stock market, mutual funds, all that fun stuff. There's also appreciation in, in alternative investments as well as the cash flow aspect. So blending those two together and, and you get a good strong portfolio where you can kind of maximize the, the benefits out of both investment types or asset classes. Dennis, and when it comes to alternative investments, I was I was reading about you a little bit. You haven't just done, you know, multifamily real estate. You've done multiple different types of alternative asset classes outside of real estate. What are, you know, what is one or two other asset classes that you've invested in? Sure. So I'm um, the more, I guess the longer I am in the alternative investment space, I just realized how much of it is really dependent on like some key relationships that we do have. And we're not like deal specific. We're more relationship specific. So it depends on who brings us a specific deal. Like we have a core of like 10 to 12 operators that we talk to almost on a daily basis. Some of them are in mobile home parks. Some of them are in self storages. Some of them do startup investing. So it depends on what they bring us is where we kind of lean towards from an operational perspective. We mainly do affordable housing and hospitality. Those are the two divisions that we do as a, a company, as SIH Capital Group. But we're all about what relationships do we have to leverage. We have, for example, last year, we created a joint venture for hard money lending. And that's, you know, private lending. We're getting great rates. Again, key partnership. We're, it's a joint venture. We work together on that. So everything from there, uh, we've also done strictly limited partnership stuff where we've invested in ATM funds, where we've looked into life insurance settlements. So we, what we find is that there's, there's so much commonality between a lot of these different alternative investments. Once you really learn, let's say, the basics of multifamily, it's not a big transition to learning self-storage and mobile home parks and everything like that. So that's why I actually call multifamily like the gateway drug. Uh, because that's what's going to familiarize yourself with like a PPM, a security document, a basic offering, an LP versus GP split, what a waterfall is, all of that stuff. And then once you kind of realize all that stuff, then it just repeats in other asset classes. And and would you say that the, I guess, the underwriting process that you use personally, does that transfer into those other asset classes or do you have to tailor it to each one? Yeah, I, I think it just depends on our involvement in the project. Like, so as limited partners, it's it's pretty much goes on trust and relationships. Uh, yeah, during the original few couple of deals, uh, we would underwrite our, ourselves. We've gone away from a lot of the limited partnership sides. Like over the last like four or five years, we've transitioned more and more to joint ventures and general partnership sides. So we're actually part of the underwriting process a lot of times. So we so we understand the deal as good as anybody else on on that general partnership side. Uh, so it, it's just more of I I don't think like if you if you can underwrite a multifamily you'll necessarily underwrite ATM funds for example. That's going to be a little bit nuanced. But in terms of yeah, if you know how to underwrite multifamily, you probably can with some adjustments and tweaks. Understand at least understand the underwriting of a mobile home park or self storage, 
facility and stuff like that. And so you, I mean, you already, you already mentioned it, but you guys are doing a lot of JV stuff uh, on the operator side. What is SIH Capital Group's role when you joint venture? Is it, I mean, is it the same every time or do you guys, like, do you have a, a hat that you wear when it comes to the GP side? That's a good point. A lot of it's on the asset management side. So to us, that's really the most important aspect of an investment. It's sometimes it's easy to close. It's hard to operate. It really depends on some. So anything affordable housing and hospitality, we're the leads on. Those are our asset classes. Those are the ones where we have relationships in terms of everything from acquiring to operating. We have our own management companies for both divisions. It's really, really hands-on with that stuff. Other, other asset classes like mobile home parks and self-storage will we'll co-asset manage, but we won't take the lead. Like We will work with someone who exclusively does self-storage at that point. We won't just capital raise for, for people. That's, that's kind of against what we believe in. But there are different levels of operational involvement. I would say from affordable housing to hospitality, that's, that's like 100% involvement to more like, hey, from um, like self-storage, for example, like we do a lot of the investor relations. Uh, we coordinate trips out there so that our investors actually see the property. We work on certain compliance issues with them, but, it, but the day-to-day -day is really run by the lead operators. Okay. And- I, I I was having another conversation yesterday, actually, and the way that he described it, which is kind of in line with what you said, is, you know, the the warm up is getting the deal closed, and once the deal closes, that's when the actual race starts. And I think a lot of people have that backwards, where they think, oh, they closed the deal, I got the deal, now I can, you know, I can just let it do its thing, which is actually not the case. And I like how you said that asset management and you know anyone could close but actually running the business plan and, and managing the asset efficiently is is the meat and potatoes behind everything yeah and I, I think what that statement really represents is there's a shift right now in the the syndication world where i think when we first got started 2000 let's say 10 2012 when we first started investing as lps the business plan wasn't an operational one. The business plan was basically a glorified fix and flip. Mm -hmm. It would be to come in renovate a handful of units and get it back to the same broker that sold it to them, get, get the premium, then someone else pays the premium for 10 units, does another five to 10, flips it again. There's really very little operational. Like it's just, it, it's, it's, it's this race, like, Hey, in 18 months, if we sell this, we could get a two a two X multiple, blah, 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 blah. The moment the rates started going up in 2022, that's off the table. So it's all about the operational. If anything, it actually doesn't even make sense to go in and quickly renovate. It makes more sense to put systems in place where you could do a steady flow of renovations because you're not getting the same rent increases. You're not getting all of that stuff. So I think it's just a sign of the times. We personally prefer this because that actually is like when you focus on operations, that actually aligns well with a long-term hold um, versus the people who are just trying to flip this thing as quick as possible. And now here's a word from our sponsor. Get things done while you're on the move. Learn more about working with a virtual assistant through off-site professionals. It's a great way to get all the things done that you need to get done. Have freedom in your time and streamline your life by automating your business. Stop spending time on the tasks that you can delegate and start spending more time on your superpower. Call us today at 503-446-3177 or visit our website at offsiteprofessionals.com. Uptown Syndication is now offering a syndication coaching program for you to take your real estate portfolio to the next level. This is your opportunity to have experienced syndicators, AJ and Chris Shepard, coach you on your way to controlling your real estate investing future. Our coaching program will provide you with the tools and framework needed to begin syndicating real estate in your target market. Go to uptownsyndication.com today to learn more. I think that is, I mean, I've, I've understood that personally. I'm in asset management for our portfolio and everything like that. But the way that you just described that hits home. And I didn't even realize that it could be articulated that way. But I mean, you're right. It used to be, let's get this churn and burn 18 months, get it back to market. And now, I mean, it's, yeah, I, I just blew my mind because you articulated it in a way of what I've been thinking for the last two, three years now. 
of, yeah, it's not about who can raise money and close a deal. It's about who can operate an asset and, and actually run the business plan. So that was, I'm going to make sure we clip that. Sorry to go off on a tangent. I'm going to make sure we clip that and post that everywhere we can, because that was a great, great insight from you, Dennis. I appreciate that. When it comes to doing the actual asset management, I know you said, you know, hospitality, affordable housing, that's your guys' kind of bread and butter. What does your asset management look like in terms of, you know, are you going in and doing rent increases and, and uh, uh, hospitality, you know, but rate increases and that kind of thing? Or what does your normal, I guess, asset management or business plan look like for those asset classes? Yeah, so it'd be easier to kind of uh, break it out, Hospi uh, hospitality and, and uh, affordable housing. So let's start with affordable housing because that's way more traditional multifamily. It's just basically, it's multifamily that has an element of income restrictions. And because of those restrictions and compliances, we actually have way less competition out there than the, the regular, you know, your mom and pop value add kind of deals. So with that, the number one thing that involved with asset management is to make you sure your property management systems are in place. Uh, so we started using a third party property manager we quickly realized that that was not what we signed up for. We couldn't be effective asset managers with a third party property managers. There was just not enough accountability. You could tell that they were stretched. You could tell that they were only giving us a day a month. It wasn't that. And then at that, and then it falls on us because at the end of the day, the assets underperforming, you can't blame. And th that's the problem. The last decade, every syndicator who has done a bad deal, their number one reason for them doing a bad deal is the fact that the property manager and they had to fire them and then they went for the second and third. So for two years, from the time we acquired our first affordable housing, our mission was don't acquire anything else. Let's just figure out this property management stuff and figure out how do we do property, how do we do an internal property management company with only 72 units? Because everybody says, oh, you need a thousand units, you need 300 units, 400 units, whatever it is. Well, how do we figure it out? How do we leverage technology? How do we leverage the tools that we have, the people in place? How do we do it with 72 units? And that was that was a nine month problem figuring that out. Once that's in place, now you got a property management company. Now, then the sky's the limit. Then it, it becomes like a 10X situation where we could go now and acquire another two, three properties. Probably that's that would be our cap with our current systems. Uh, but it, it's it's completely much easier to do because now you can just plug and play them. Uh, so our asset management includes, you know, getting on the phone once once a week with the property manager. Uh, we do oversee rent increases. Like the bottom line is from an ROI perspective, there's probably nothing like that in terms of, you know, our property manager, is, she's great. No issues there. But here's your 15 rent increases. Make sure they're done. We just want them done. Like we don't want excuses. We don't want anything like here, get them done. Um, the other thing is with housing authority, because we are in affordable housing, we have a relationship with housing authority. Housing authority is dealing with the same thing that everybody else is. So short labor, short everything. So it's almost unfair for our property manager to have to follow up 18 times on rent increases. However, as asset managers, and we also have the same relationships with the housing authority, it's not too much skin on our back to just follow up with that. So stuff like rent increases, huge. Um, otherwise, implementing like revenue added, uh, revenue additions. Like one of the things we always always supervise is a water savings plan. Like we do that day one. Like we go in, we bulk order like the 0.8 gallon per flush toilets. Um, we bulk order the shower heads. We bulk order everything. Our main team goes in there. We want status reports. We want to make sure that all of that is done. Um, as asset manager, we're supervising any construction projects that are going on in the in the in the project. We're also trying to see from like a revenue creation perspective. One of the things like we did was we had washer and dryers in all of our units. Um, we tried to build back the tenants for the washer and dryers and got overruled due to housing authority regulations. And once that happened, as an asset manager, we had to make a decision. We said, well, what's, is it more important to offer that as an amenity for people, but be responsible for washers and dryers that we couldn't charge the, the tenants? Or do we just start, as they break, start pulling them out, and then people are responsible for their own washer and dryer? 
Uh, so those are the kind of decisions that we had to make as asset managers. You don't really underwrite that on the original business plan that, you know, but at the same time, as they start coming up, as we're paying the bills for these washer and dryer repairs, as asset managers, that's when you're making the decision, like, well, what's more important, the amenity cost or or um, uh, fixing these and keep keeping them on as an amenity. So that's kind of the asset management side. Um, we're also, you know, overseeing delinquency the delinquency reports, um, that's kind of like the basics on it. Uh, we are fortunate because we are in affordable housing. We have a pretty big waiting list. So it's usually we don't, our occupancy fluctuates from like 96 to hundred percent. So it's not much on the occupancy management. We'll, we'll keep tabs on any vacancies we have. You know, we like our company models, like vacancies are cancer. You just like, you, 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 you get it added right away. It makes a big, big difference. Um, that's affordable housing side. On the hospitality side, this is like a completely different animal where it's almost the complete opposite. Um, hospitality side, and I work, we have a different partnership team. So the people who are making the asset management decisions for affordable housing are not the ones that are making the asset management decisions for the hospitality. Hospitality is all about brand experience. Uh, we usually do pretty luxury high-end stuff. We're really focused on the Jersey Shore because that, that's where we're located. Um, so everything from brand experience to tenant communication, all of that stuff kind of falls on their asset management. Very, very different, very, very different animal, but we, we kind of, we, this is the, this is the space we kind of, uh, fell in love with. So, and we don't, we don't necessarily have any quote unquote affordable housing stuff in our personal portfolio. So it is interesting to hear you talk about the asset management. I guess KPIs or, or what you're paying attention to um, on that side of things. And a lot of it aligns with what I do, you know, as an asset manager for multifamily stuff. But I, 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 it was interesting to hear you talk about the, you know, water savings plan, the, you know, the, the maintenance costs, how that's such a key piece, as well as the rent increases. Because a lot of what I focus on is occupancy, delinquency obviously rent increases because that's revenue, but, you know, and, and maintenance costs overseeing those. So they all align, but the way you had a very detailed and specific plan for water savings is, you know, something that we don't have, <laughs> have personally, but it is something that I might look to implement because, you know, you save water, you save on that cost. Do you guys ever, are you able to charge the tenants back for utilities or is that all included in the rent? It's, it's all included in the rent. Um, we do, once we're out of certain compliance periods, uh, like for example, one of our most recent projects, it has, the reason why we're not allowed to charge for washer and dryers is during the original build, the original developer was given money for washer and dryers. Now this is like 24 years ago. Those are not the same washer and dryers, whatever it is. But once the, there's six more years and actually less, we're, we're down to four years on compliance period. Once we hit 2028, we're no longer then the the original all the original benefits of the original that once a developer phased out and now we could go and charge it the, the 30 40 dollars it's not an issue um so there are weird restrictions but kind of cool thing is we're gonna have a good amount of revenue coming online in in, in three four years that you know we could go in buy brand new washer and dryers for everybody rent them out or simply just rent out the actual hookup where you go in and you master lock it and then just charge people, hey, you bring in your own washer and dryer, but we'll unlock the hookup for you. Like we've seen that done. I kind of actually really like that model from an operational perspective. But it's it's really about like one of my roles on my team is that I pay a lot of the invoices. And I would say that maybe is the most critical part of asset management. Like if you're not paying the invoices, you really are seeing like 10% of what's really happening. Um, I'll like some good examples is whenever I like a uh, look at the trash pickups bills, usually you put them on auto pay, but the moment there's any fluctuation, open it up and look. And then what happens like the last two out of six months, completely missed it. Whenever the trash can lid, the bin uh, on the container is not fully closed, they charge you for overages. Even if a tenant just left it and the and the and the actual bin is not completely full, they'll charge you for overages. So seeing stuff like that and then being able to relate it to the construction manager, uh, to the main team 
they're like, hey, the Sunday, be- I mean, the, the night before, that lid better be closed, blah, blah, blah. Um, stuff like that, where you'll see dumpage charges, like, hey, what's going on with that? Stuff like that. So those invoices actually speak volumes and gives you a lot of guidance on what conversations you need to be having during the week. And you can't expect your property manager to catch that stuff. You know, they're in the day to day of it. You're the one that's looking at some of these invoices. You're the ones that's seeing it. It's kind of like it's going to be either on you to catch it or they're not going to catch it on that level. Uh, they're being inundated by tenant requests and construction and blah, blah, blah. So and then also hearing what your manager is actually telling you, like one or two, like two, three weeks ago, we implemented a change where we said, close your office and make it appointments only for two days a week because you're not getting a couple of assignments done. What's going on? Well, the random people are stopping in and they're taking 45 minutes to an hour of your time. Okay. When they stop in, tell them, hey, no problem. We definitely want to hear your concerns, blah, blah, blah. We, Thursdays are walk-in hours from this time to this time come Thursday. And this way, Thursday, you're not answering emails. You're just dealing with tenants, blah, blah, blah. But now you're taking that like randomness out of your schedule of people stopping by. So that's kind of, I think, like the core benefits you could kind of implement on the asset management side is like actually looking at all the invoices because those invoices are going to go right into the PL. And then when you hear your manager gripe, try to figure out is there like an actual system that you can implement that can make her life easier. Yeah, I think the the invoice thing and being on top of invoices and expenses is something that is crucial. And I really like how you brought that up because if you're if you have an accounting team or, or or someone else paying them and you're just seeing the PL at the end of the month, it's usually too late to make those adjustments in real time. And then you're having to go back and and try to implement new processes to change things that have, have probably been occurring for months already that you're not seeing in real time. So I think that's a great, great insight there. Um, Dennis, I wanna I wanna ask you more about you know, how or why you guys chose to, to really focus on the affordable housing and, and talk to me about what, I guess, what drove you to that specific asset class um, to be your, your focus. So this is just a byproduct of a certain partnership that we had, that I kind of ended up having. Um, the person we partnered SIH with is a guy named Anthony Khan. He got into affordable housing space two, three years earlier. And we we met at a, um, it's like a slash conference slash open house for a new syndication that was going on during COVID. We met, we quickly became really, really good friends. And the more he was telling me about this niche, he got me hooked on it. Uh, just realizing that not anybody could do it. You got to be like state certified. And once you got the certification, now you got a barrier entry. Uh, there's just so many things in there that, that um, started appealing to me because I started seeing the cracks on the traditional value add deals where I became more and more skeptical of the model where you could just buy, you know, do, you know, renovations of flooring material and put a nicer kitchen and then charge, you know, a 30% premium. I started to become more and more skeptical of this model, of that model. And then on the affordable housing side, that model did not revolve at all on any of that stuff. Like we, our renovations, like, yeah, we put the luxury vinyl flooring on the thing, but we're not upping people's rent by three, four hundred dollars Most of the time we're, we're, we're filing for the maximum allowable income restriction. Like we know what our, what our uh, rent increases are going to be from day one. So we don't even have to like really even renovate the unit. We can keep them as is, but we're trying to create a better, you know, environment for the tenants because that, produces less turnover. And then the, I think the end, besides the fact that it's, that our partner kind of brought us into this space, I think the number one reason why we like affordable housing space is it usually lends itself to a really long hold period. Like we are working on a project now, and I don't want to give too many details because I'm not sure if it's going to be a 506 or 506 e but the compliance period ends in 2041. But because of that, we're getting we're getting the property at $36,000 a door, wow. which is an incredible for 2024. Like, and 
so basically they're saying you're going to get a huge discount as long as you hold it for 17 years. And we don't plan to ever own anything less than 10 years. So, and then in 10 years, there's going to be a natural equity appreciation because now you're only seven years away from the end of the compliance period. So it almost is like too good to be true. It's like, well, our model is a long haul and you're going to give us like a 50% discount because we, we need you to hold it for 10 years. And it's like, it, it aligns itself perfectly for a really long-term, a long-term minded investor. Yeah, that's, that's exciting. That's exciting stuff. Well, Dennis, where can people connect with you or hear more from you? Uh, the best place is my website, sihcapitalgroup.com, capital with an A. My first name is Dennis, D-N-I-S, at sihcapitalgroup.com. Just reach out via email, and then uh, you could find a copy of my book where I kind of went go over all the different asset classes that I invested in as a limited partner. Uh, ironically, the two asset classes that are not in there are hospitality and affordable housing, <laughs> which I probably have to put in a second edition of the book. But yeah, you could find the book at the uh, Amazon, the Alternative Investment Almanac, Expert Insights on Building Traditional in, Building. General, I, I screwed up the title. Expert Insights on Building Wealth in Non Traditional Ways. That's that's the title. Uh, and uh, yeah, you can find the book there. Reach out to me on my website. I'd love to connect with you guys. Awesome. Well, Dennis, thank you so much for joining the show today and and sharing about traditional and alternative asset classes blend well in a portfolio. And for offering a lot of good insight on, you know, what the current market is is requiring out of general partners and sponsors. Yeah, Trent, thank you so much for having me. It's been a blast. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Real Estate Professionals Investing Podcast on WIN, your community of investing knowledge for growth. We hope that this episode has increased your knowledge and added value to your path to freedom. If you would, please take a second to rate us so that we can get more great investors to interview. If you or someone that you know wants to be on, please visit westsideinvestors.com and fill out our form to be on the show. Thank you again and enjoy your day.